Welcome. The following is my research and my thoughts on infectious disease history and where we are today. I think this information will provide a different perspective on infectious diseases and how we react to them. I hope the following will open up a new debate on what has been happening over the last many months and actually years. I also hope that it helps take down the record high fear level that has overwhelmed so many. If you're hearing some or all of this information for the first time, I'm sure it will be quite a shock and your first inclination is to think none of this can be true. I understand. I still remember my trip years ago to my local library where I did my first chart on a piece of graph paper on measles deaths from a reference book they had there. Knowing when measles vaccination started, I sat there looking at the chart and shaking my head in disbelief. It was a complete shock to my belief system at the time, so I get that feeling. Many of the slides have references or even direct links so you can look things up and verify the information. I almost always use mainstream sources, historical books, scientific journals, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, the WHO, World Health Organization, etc. I think it's important that people do their own research to form their own opinions. I'm just providing my information and my thoughts. Too often we listen to the media, politicians, and other public characters to spoon feed us and I think that is the source of a lot of the mess we're in today. I really strive to be honest and accurate, so anything that anyone thinks I'm mistaken about, please let me know. I'd love to get feedback. You can use the email dissolvingillusionsbook at gmail.com. One of my favorite quotes is from John Stuart Mill. The fatal tendency of mankind to leave off thinking about a thing when it is no longer doubtful is the cause of half their errors. We should always keep an open mind, and just because most people believe something doesn't make it true. I think this is something we all should keep in mind so we don't fall into the trap of groupthink. I also think that everyone's first duty is to the truth, scientific, historical, spiritual truth. No matter what evidence you find that might contradict your beliefs, everyone needs to accept the possibility of being mistaken and pursue that truth no matter where it leads. Sometimes you're alone with something you have found to be true, but that's okay because the truth doesn't mean agreeing with the majority or being popular. It isn't always easy to accept another way of thinking that partially or completely disrupts the pattern laid down for us since we were young, but if it contains the ring of truth, then it's worth considering and exploring. It's essential to know history. It's how we can make the best decisions in the present. In the following, I will be sharing data that anyone can find and verify. The data is not a theory or belief. These are hard facts. All the charts are based on public health records and other historical documents. On these charts, the mortality rate is normalized to deaths per 100,000 to account for population changes over time. In this chart, you can see the deaths from several infectious diseases declining from 1900 through until 1965 in the United States. Measles, scarlet fever, typhoid, whooping cough, and diphtheria. Deaths from all these diseases were all steadily declining and hitting zero or near zero by the 1950s or 1960s. Of note here is that a diphtheria vaccine was introduced in the 1920s, but it really didn't change the trend down at all of that disease. It's also unknown just how widely used this vaccine was. The whooping cough vaccine wasn't used until the late 1940s, and the measles vaccine didn't come into use until 1963. The deaths for both of those diseases were approaching zero before these vaccines were put into use. Also note that penicillin, the first antibiotic, wasn't in mass production until the mid-1940s, so that really didn't have much of an impact on these diseases. England has the best data since they began keeping mortality records in 1838, 62 years before the United States. Here we can see measles, scarlet fever, whooping cough, diphtheria, and smallpox. The big killer is obviously scarlet fever, which is considered a bacterial disease. It started to really drop in the late 1800s and practically vanished as a cause of death by the mid-1900s. Scarlet fever is caused by streptococcal A infection, commonly known as strep throat, which we no longer fear. By the way, there is, was no, at least not in wide use, of a scarlet fever vaccine. Measles, whooping cough, and diphtheria all declined from the late 1800s into the mid-1900s. Smallpox is a special case, and it is where we get this term vaccination. I'll cover that a bit later in this presentation. What's important to know about all these infectious diseases is the death rate, how deadly they were, were all falling and becoming not a real problem by the mid-1900s, 
without any major modern medical intervention. From that same chart, here is just measles. Measles is considered a viral disease. In England, they began using the vaccine in 1968. By that time, from the peak in the 1800s, the death rate had declined by 99.96%, almost 100%. Here is a magnified view of the same data with an exponential trend line. It's almost impossible to see much of an effect on the death rate after the vaccine was introduced. In the United States, measles vaccination began in 1963, which was a killed measles virus vaccine. It was later switched for a new vaccine in 1967, which was a live measles virus vaccine, because there were unanticipated problems with the 1963 vaccine. Data in the United States starts in the year 1900. There isn't much of a history as England, so we, here we see a 98% decline in deaths before the vaccine in 1963, which I think would have been closer to England's near 100%. We just don't have data going back into the 1800s. Here is a magnified view of the same data with an exponential trend line. Here we can see somewhat of an effect on the death rate, but it's certainly not huge. As with other Western countries, measles mortality rate had declined considerably in France before the vaccine became available in 1966. Yet after its introduction, vaccination rates remained relatively low. Again, you can see that it was a much bigger killer early in the century, and then by 1966, it wasn't much of a problem. Here is a magnified view of the same data. In 1983, the vaccination rate was less than 20%. In that year, there were 20 deaths attributed to measles out of a population of over 54 million. That's a rate of 0.037 per 100,000, or approximately 1 in 2.7 million. By 1989, the vaccination rate was still only 40%. There were three deaths attributed to measles in that year, a rate of 0.005 per 100,000, or 1 in 19.4 million. To put this into perspective, by comparing it to the National Safety Council statistics, you were more than three times as likely to be killed by being hit by lightning, odds of 1 in 5.5 million, than dying from measles in France in 1989, odds of 1 in 19.4 million. Here we can see the diseases we've already talked about, now including flu and pneumonia and tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, pneumonia, and influenza were far larger killers than most other infectious diseases of the time. During the 1900s, these three diseases were killing 5 to 16 times more people than typhoid, scarlet fever, whooping cough, measles, or diphtheria. Except for the 1918 flu pandemic, the trend was going down throughout the 1900s. Flu and pneumonia from 1900 to the 1970s went down from 200 deaths per 100,000 to about 30 or less which is an 85% decrease in mortality. Tuberculosis deaths had an over 95% decline. Another view of influenza and pneumonia deaths shows about an 85% decline to around the 1980s, which afterward went back up slightly. This is a close-up view with added flu vaccine coverage for the 65 plus age range. Interestingly, as vaccine coverage went up, so did the death rate. If this vaccine was that effective, you would expect the death rate to go down, not up. Around 2007, flu pneumonia deaths finally went down close to the early 1980s levels. Here is one of the actual documents with a link. For 2017, the number of recorded deaths from flu pneumonia was over 55,000, or 2.0% of all deaths, or at a rate of 17.1 per 100,000. By the way, in 1999, there was a change from the old classification and coding system called the ICD, or International Classification of Diseases. It went from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So to compare with pre-1999 data, you have to divide by a factor of 0.69. So for 2017, you get a value of 24.5 that you see on the chart. I have an Excel spreadsheet available with all references and all the data just for the flu. If anyone wants this document, please email me and I will send it to you and you can verify the data for yourself. Bottom line, it seems that after years of flu vaccine promotion and coverage, the deaths from flu pneumonia haven't decreased and certainly haven't gone away. That's about 40 years and still the death rate from influenza pneumonia is about the same. So what all this data clearly shows is that deaths from various infectious diseases, bacterial and viral, all declined well before the vaccines were being used 
as well as most modern medical interventions like penicillin that started to be used in the mid-1940s. Something else had to be going on, but what seems to have happened is the focus was not on what caused such an incredible saving in lives, but entirely on vaccines and other medical interventions. When I was working on the book Dissolving Illusions, there was almost nothing in the medical literature that I could find, virtually no charts looking at mortality data. No one seemed to have looked and noticed this enormous decline in deaths. I did find one study in the American Journal of Public Health in 1980 that had a chart on measles deaths. The authors were focused only on the vaccine and presented their data in a logarithmic chart. That type of chart puts emphasis on a small change. Notice on the left axis each tick mark is a factor of 10 bigger than the one below it. 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 1, and 1 to 10. The authors call the decrease in deaths on this chart after the introduction of the vaccine as striking. It certainly looks that way from this type of chart, but that's really an illusion. Taking the exact same data and charting it as a percent change from peak, it's clear that the vast majority of the improvement happened well before the vaccine, yet the study doesn't mention the decline in deaths before the vaccine. Reading the paper, you would almost certainly be left with the impression that measles vaccine was the most crucial factor in eliminating measles deaths, which is clearly not the case. Here is another example of a positive bias towards vaccination while ignoring the historical trend. This was a lengthy study on whooping cough and the whooping cough vaccine published in 1988 in the journal Pediatrics. The paper's first paragraph states that 5 to 10,000 whooping cough deaths decreased to 5 to 10 deaths due to mass immunization. The authors reference a document titled Historical Statistics of the United States Colonial Times to 1957. Here is the actual document that was referenced, which you can find online. From this document, it was clear that between 1900 and 1934, anywhere from 5 to roughly 10,000 people died each year from whooping cough. Another paper from the CDC also showed that from about 1970 to the time of the study in 1988, there were approximately 5 to 10 annual deaths from whooping cough. So in fact, the author's statement is true, however it's based on selective data and did not at all represent the full picture. It's very deceiving, intentional or not. Using the author's reference document and charting the data, it's clear that the most marked decline in deaths from whooping cough occurred before the introduction of the vaccine in the late 1940s. Looking at the percent decline from the peak, the author's data shows that the death rate from whooping cough in the United States had fallen by approximately 92% before the vaccine was in widespread use. And the vaccine also had no obvious effect on the downward trend. Data from England and Wales is even more striking, showing that the death rate from whooping cough had dropped by more than 99% before the vaccine began to be used. The belief that vaccination was instrumental in the decline of death from whooping cough is not supported by the data. Yet when reading the paper from the Pediatrics Journal, the reader, usually a pediatrician or another doctor, would have accepted the belief that the vaccine was the only factor. Both of these studies are examples of half-truths. Either they were honest scientific errors, or their purpose was to promote a point of view and not to reveal the entire truth. Because of seriously flawed papers like these, many have fallen under the illusion that vaccination caused a decline in deaths from measles, whooping cough, and other infectious diseases. Here we see the total deaths per year in England from whooping cough, the left axis. National use of the vaccine began in 1957, well after the deaths were much of an issue. You can see the vaccine coverage on the right axis. Even when vaccination coverage dipped low, it really didn't have much of an effect on the number of deaths. Here's an interesting chart that really shows the decline in combined deaths from several infectious diseases, scarlet fever, whooping cough, measles, diphtheria, and smallpox. You can see that the data really flows with a nice smooth trend line down, starting around 1874. Vaccines didn't have much of an impact at all with the main ones we think of today coming well after the vast majority of the decline had already happened. Here is the same chart starting in 1901. Again, a nice smooth downward trend. The mortality data we've looked at is all in the public health record. This is all hidden in plain sight and has been almost entirely ignored. This is a shocking tragedy as we could have learned so much from that decline that would apply today. The focus has always been on medical interventions and in particular on vaccines and not what happened to cause such a dramatic drop in deaths from infectious diseases. 
Because this data was overlooked, it has helped create the illusion of vaccination saving us from massive death that existed in the 1800s into the early 1900s. That's what I certainly believed before I looked at the data. Almost everyone I know thought this until they started looking at the actual data. So far I've talked about mortality decline. What is often noted is that the incidence, the number of cases, had declined after the introduction of the vaccine. You can see a clear drop after 1963. There is actually more to the history of this disease incidence decline, but suffice it to say the vaccine did cause a certain amount of interruption in measles transmission. However, that first 1963 measles vaccine had to be replaced with the new 1967 vaccine because of its serious problems. It was then promised that by the end of 1967, measles would be wiped out. That would, of course, not happen. The original plan of measles elimination by 1967 or shortly after was an utter failure. A single shot was replaced and later with multiple shots and then eventually 37 years after starting their notion of elimination, the CDC would declare measles eliminated from the United States in the year 2000. That would not be the end of measles as even in 2019 there were around 700 cases of measles. Interestingly, measles incident was already on the decline before the use of the vaccine. If you extend a linear trend line, it ends in the year 2000. That's the same year that the CDC declared measles eliminated in the United States. With what we have covered, it begs the question if the measles vaccine was really worth it. Of course, that is complete blasphemy to even pose such a question in our current society. But after reviewing these charts, it makes sense to me. This quote is from the British Medical Journal in 1959, before the idea of the measles vaccine came into vogue. Like we have seen in the charts, it's clear here measles consider a relatively mild illness in most. Over 10 years, all children recover from measles with, by the way, more than likely lifelong immunity. Quote, in this practice, measles is considered a relatively mild and inevitable childhood ailment that is best encountered any time from three to seven years of age. Over the past 10 years, there have been few serious complications at any age, and all children have made complete recoveries. As a result of this reasoning, no special attempts have been made at prevention even in young infants in whom the disease has not been found to be especially serious. Whenever there are any number of cases of measles in the United States, it's almost always accompanied by a great deal of fear. The vaccine has been assumed to be the only solution and there is a belief without vaccination we will all suffer horribly with a huge number of deaths. From what I have already gone over in the charts and quotes, this fear is really unneeded. In 1953, Dr. Klenner showed that vitamin C could be used every two hours to eliminate the infection within 48 hours. Dr. Klenner also described several other remarkable cases of recovery using vitamin C. One was a 10-month-old baby with measles. The baby had a fever of 105 degrees Fahrenheit and other symptoms of measles. Within 12 hours of vitamin C every 4 hours, the fever dropped down to normal and the baby made a complete recovery. It's quite remarkable that public health officials or the media never talk about anything that could empower people who have measles whenever there is a measles outbreak. The use of vitamin C could be one of those actions anyone could take. Measles precipitates vitamin A deficiency by depleting vitamin A stores and increasing its utilization. By giving people with measles vitamin A dramatically improved outcomes. As early as 1932, scientists found that mortality dropped by 58% when children hospitalized with measles were given cod liver oil, which contains vitamin A and D and omega-3 fatty acids. Again, the same officials never mention vitamin A to the public. Quote, Massive doses of vitamin A given to patients hospitalized with measles were associated with an approximately 60% reduction in risk of death overall, with an approximate 90% reduction among infants. Administration of vitamin A to children who developed pneumonia before or during hospital stay reduced mortality by about 70% compared with controlled children. Vitamin A administered also reduces opportunistic infections such as pneumonia and diarrhea associated with measles virus-induced immune suppression. Vitamin A supplementation has been shown to reduce the risk of complications due to pneumonia after an acute measles episode. A study in South Africa showed that the mortality could be reduced by 80% in acute measles with complications following high-dose vitamin A supplementation. Cinnamon is a common and familiar spice that has anti-infective properties. 
A 2009 study showed it to be effective in hospital-acquired infections and antibiotic-resistant bacteria, major health concerns worldwide. Cinnamon's use as an anti-infective has been known for a long time. A letter to the editor in 1878 to the medical journal The Lancet indicated that during an outbreak of cholera, all cases survived through the use of cinnamon versus another treatment, which is an injection of chloral, where 60% of patients died. This is an impressive claim since cholera had a very high fatality rate during the 1800s. Quote, has been my practice that when I meet a case of measles in a family to prescribe a course of cinnamon for all unprotected members of the family. In the majority of cases, the person so treated with cinnamon escaped the disease measles altogether or else had it in a very mild form. Quote, cinnamon is a drug whose therapeutic virtues are not sufficiently recognized. The essence of cinnamon in 25 drop doses is one of the most effective remedies in cases of inflammation of the nasal mucous membranes. Cinnamon seems to provide immunity to malaria and worked incredibly well with, for the flu. In 1907, Dr. R Ross reported the use of his cinnamon oil for 16 years to help patients quickly recover for, from the flu. Weeks of illness from the flu were reduced to three or four days. All of us would do well to consider using cinnamon as part of a protocol for the flu and other infectious diseases. Quote, cinnamon is recommended as an internal antiseptic by Dr. C.G. Grant of the British Medical Journal. He was astonished by its wonderful, wonderful influence in influenza and earnestly recommends its free use by others. Quote, Ross states that for nearly 16 years he has employed cinnamon in various forms in treating this disease, influenza. He has invariably treated influenza with cinnamon. His patients have generally been perfectly fit to return to their avocations, whatever they may have been, within three or four days and that no single case has a patient suffering from influenza been in his hands for more than a week. We often hear about antibodies with measles as measuring immunity. However, back in the 1960s, scientists discovered that children who don't produce antibodies get through measles just fine. The immune system is much more than just about antibodies, which can be relatively easily measured. The reason most people recover entirely after acute infections is because of something called innate immunity. This involves a part of the immune system that requires no memory or previous exposure and does not include preformed specific antibodies. Instead, it consists of the activation of white blood cells, including macrophages, natural killer cells, antigen-specific T lymphocytes, and the release of various cytokines, which are immune system proteins, in response to a foreign invader. This aspect of immunity is present regardless of vaccination and is highly dependent on essential nutrients. When cellular immunity is impaired, for instance in leukemia, measles can be disastrous. Quote, one of the most disconcerting discoveries in clinical medicine was finding that children who could make no antibody contracted measles in normal fashion, showed the usual sequence of symptoms and signs, and were subsequently immune. Quote, children with antibody deficient syndromes have quite unremarkable attacks of measles with the characteristic rash and normal recovery. Furthermore, they are not unduly prone to reinfection. It therefore seems that serum antibody at any rate in any quantity is not required for the production of measles rash, nor for normal recovery from the disease, nor to prevent reinfection. This is really important. The immune system is not just antibodies. It's the only thing talked about for the most part. The immune system is really complicated and no one really understands how it works. There is no test for checking the health of your immune system. However, this lack of understanding hasn't stopped people for decades from using artificial means to try and modify it. Here's a picture that shows some of the immune system complexities. Quote, a professor of immunology and rheumatology and associate director of the Institute of Immunology, Transplantation and Infection, the immune system is staggeringly complex, comprising of at least 15 different interacting cell types that spew dozens of different molecules into the blood to communicate with one another and do battle. Within each of those cells sit tens of thousands of genes whose activity can be altered by age, exercise, infection, vaccination status, diet, stress, you name it. That's an awful lot of moving parts and we don't really know what the vast majority of them do or should be doing. We can't even be sure how to tell when the immune system's not working right, let alone why not, because we don't have good metrics of what a healthy human immune system looks like. Despite 
billion spent on immune stimulants in supermarkets and drugstores last year, we don't know what, if anything, those really do or what immune stimulant even means. The negative consequences of the measles vaccine are really never discussed. For example, vaccine-induced immunity wanes over a long period of time, unlike natural infection, which is generally lifelong. This may cause large outbreaks in the future. Also, vaccination creates weaker maternal antibodies and therefore children are susceptible at a much earlier age than with their mothers who had natural infection. It's a more complicated story than is ever really talked about. I have also personally met and talked to several parents whose children were severely injured or even died after some vaccine. Not only have they had to suffer through what happened to their children, but they are attacked and ridiculed for attributing the problem to a vaccine. On a personal note, Several years ago, my mother-in-law was convinced by her then want-to-be boyfriend to get several vaccines at a local CVS. She didn't need a doctor's note or health exam of any kind. She got the shots, and shortly after, she ended up in the hospital in terrible shape. After she was discharged, she was never the same. Where before she could function in her own apartment, she now had severe dementia. She has been institutionalized for the last 10 years. But to my mind, one of the worst things is the fear of measles and the lack of understanding what to do without a vaccine. There is a fear and utter panic any time there's an outbreak of measles that occurred not too long ago at Disneyland, for example. A total reliance on vaccines as the one and only solution is fueling the fear today. There is a lot more to the history of diseases and vaccines than I have covered here. However, the fundamental thing to understand is that the death rate from measles had declined by well over 98% before any vaccine was in use, and in some instances the data shows a near 100% decline. That's essentially true of all infectious diseases of that era. That amazing information has always been missed or ignored. The alternative way to have easily handled measles with vitamin A, C, cinnamon, and others was and is never seriously considered or ever recommended separately, or better yet, in combination. Vitamin A was used in Africa, but that's not generally known. Because all the information I've been presenting isn't well known and not understood, a fallacy has been created that vaccines are the only answer for any infectious disease. This causes an incredible amount of anxiety, fear, and hate in the population whenever measles or another disease outbreak and vaccination rates aren't at or near 100%. And that anxiety, fear, and hate continue with us today with the COVID-19 problem. The following is a very brief history about smallpox. Virtually everyone knows the term vaccination. It has come to mean something given to us to provide immunity. Vaccine comes from the word vaca, the Latin word for cow. The idea was pushed forward by Edward Jenner based on the rumor among milkmaids that someone infected with cowpox could be protected from smallpox. Here the picture shows how someone's arm would be scratched with a vaccine multiple times. This was considered a success. If there was no reaction, it was considered a failure. Sometimes the reaction would be terrible, and maybe the person would lose their arm, for example. Before the smallpox vaccine became popular, people often tried protecting themselves from smallpox by purposely infecting themselves with smallpox. The person then had to be provided with health support, and they would often obtain immunity and recover. But sometimes it would trigger a smallpox epidemic. This smallpox inoculation could start an epidemic or stop one. So there was a strong desire to think of something safer. So in 1798, Edward Jenner performed his experiment and took pus from a cow's udder and scratched it onto a boy named James Phipps. Later, the child was deliberately exposed to smallpox to test the protective property of the cowpox inoculation. When the boy did not contract clinical smallpox, it was assumed that the cowpox inoculation was successful, it would also provide lifelong protection against smallpox. That is usually when the story ends in most books that mention Jenner that I've read. It was a great discovery that saved us from smallpox. We lived happily ever after. The end. But was this really the real story? This chart shows that smallpox didn't go away after 1798 when Edward Jenner started this notion of vaccination. It continued on with periodic epidemics for the next 74 years, despite increasingly strict vaccination laws. There was a massive smallpox epidemic that occurred in 1871 and 1872, despite these strict laws. That's the large gray spike toward the middle of the chart. 
After the pandemic, smallpox deaths declined along with all other infectious diseases of the time and practically vanished by the early 1900s. So smallpox was around in England for a hundred years, a century, despite this invention of vaccination. By the way, I always thought it was interesting that the pattern of smallpox, a viral disease, uh, deaths mirrored almost perfectly a much bigger killer scarlet fever, a bacterial disease. It always seemed to me there could have been some type of relationship where they somehow worked together to cause massive death, so I kept the two on the same chart. That's just an observation and an unproven theory of mine. Boston is one example where there were strict vaccination laws. In 1855, strict laws were put in place that ensured that no unvaccinated child could attend school. Other measures were made to ensure all citizens were vaccinated. Quote, in 1855, Massachusetts took the most advanced stand ever taken by any of the states and enacted a law which required parents or guardians to cause the vaccination of all children before they were two years old and forbade the admission of all children to public schools of any child who had not been duly vaccinated. The selectmen of towns, mayors, and aldermen of cities were to enforce the vaccination of all the inhabitants and to require revaccination whenever they judged the public health to require it. All employees of manufacturing companies, all inmates of almshouses, reform schools, lunatic asylums, and other places where the poor and sick are received or houses of corrections, jails, prisons, of all institutions supported wholly or partly by the state were to furnish the means of vaccination to such persons as were unable to pay. Boston data begins in 1811 and shows that starting around 1837 there were periodic smallpox epidemics. Following the 1855 mandates, there were smallpox epidemics in 1859, 1864, and 1867, culminating with a massive epidemic in 1872. These repeat smallpox epidemics showed that strict vaccination laws instituted in Boston had no real beneficial effect. In the table, you can see that in Boston from 1856 to 1876, 20 years after the 1855 laws, there were 85% more deaths than there were from 1835 to 1855, 20 years before the 1855 laws. And while there was this promise of vaccination to protect someone from smallpox, people also died directly of the vaccine. From 1859 to 1922, official deaths related to vaccination totaled more than 1,600 in England. Concerns over vaccine safety, effectiveness, and governmental infringement on personal liberty and freedom through compulsory vaccination stoked the fires of the anti-vaccination movement. People had also experienced severe disability and death from the vaccine. Because of this, the people began to resist the government and choose to pay fines instead of being vaccinated. Some even accepted imprisonment rather than allowing vaccination for themselves or their children. The public backlash culminated in the Great Demonstration in Leicester, England in 1885. That same year, Leicester's government, which had pushed for vaccination through the use of fines and jail time, was replaced with a new government that was opposed to compulsory vaccination. On the chart, you can see after the 1871 smallpox pandemic, the vaccination rate dropped off. By 1887, the vaccination coverage rates had dropped to 10%, yet there was no resurgence of smallpox despite such low vaccination rates. When the people of Leicester decided not to vaccinate, there was a harsh condemnation for their actions. The medical community of the time thought what the inhabitants of Leicester were doing was a gigantic experiment that would result in a terrible massacre, especially in the unprotected children. Yet despite the lack of vaccination in Leicester, there was never again a real problem with smallpox. That so-called experiment went on for 60 years. Low smallpox vaccination rates didn't matter. Along with other infectious diseases, smallpox vanished as a serious threat. Quote, the experience in Leicester is confirmed and strongly confirmed by that of the whole country. Vaccination has been steadily declining ever since the conscientious clause was introduced. Until now, nearly two-thirds of the children born are not vaccinated. Yet smallpox mortality has also declined until quite negligible. After the summer of 1897, the severe type of smallpox with its high death rate, with the rare exception, had entirely disappeared from the United States. Smallpox turned from a disease that killed one in five of its victims to one that only killed anywhere from 1 in 50 and later on to as low as 1 in 380. 
The disease could still kill, but it was mistaken for various other pox infections or skin eruptions, having become so much more mild. Even chicken pox. So our perception that smallpox is and was always a big killer isn't true. It became much less deadly at the same time all other infectious disease killers became much less fatal. By the 1920s and into the 1930s, mild smallpox had almost completely replaced the severe form in the United States. Once the mild type of smallpox became prevalent, there was no evidence that it ever reverted to the older, more virulent type. Quote, Although mild cases of smallpox were known before, they have come practically to replace the severe forms in many extensive areas, such as the whole United States, Brazil, large parts of Africa. So the idea that vaccination against smallpox was this amazing success isn't borne out by the data and historical information. Like the other infectious diseases of the era, it simultaneously declined in lethality. What changed to cause this massive decline in deaths from infectious disease if it wasn't vaccines and antibiotics? How did we get to where life was relatively free of death from these infectious diseases by the 1950s to the 1970s? Through our fantasies, we have created a mostly false picture of life in the past. I love movies and TV shows, but they don't really show how things were for the vast majority of people that lived back then. Most films and television shows show healthy looking people in clean environments wearing beautiful costumes. That just wasn't reality. It's hard to imagine today how people lived before our modern times. Hordes of people crowded beneath smoldering water rotter roofs or burrowed among rats of clammy cellars. Quote, the Tenement House Commission long afterward called the worst of the barracks infant slaughterhouses and showed by reference to the mortality list that they killed one in every five babies born in them. Jacob A. Reese, 1902. The following is from the book The Bitter Cry of Outcast London, published in 1883. Quote, Few who will read these passages have any conception of what these pestilent human rookeries are, where tens of thousands are crowded together, amidst horrors which call to mind what we have heard of the middle passage of the slave ship. To get to them, you have to penetrate courts reeking with poisonous gases arising from the accumulation of sewage and refuse, scattered in all directions, and often flowing beneath your feet courts, many of them which the sun never penetrates, which are never visited by a breath of fresh air, and which rarely know the virtues of a drop of cleansing water. You have to ascend rotten staircases, which threaten to give way beneath every step, leaving gaps to imperil the limbs and the lives of the unwary. You have to grope your way along dark and filthy passages, swarming with vermin. Then, if you are not driven back by the intolerable stench, you may gain admittance to the dens in which these thousands of beings who belong, as much as you, to the race of for whom Christ died, heard together. Today, most of us can turn on the tap and get relatively clean water. We have toilets and garbage removal. Most of that we take for granted. Quote, the manner in which the great multitude of the poor is treated by society today is revolting. They are drawn into the large cities where they breathe a poorer atmosphere than in the country. They are relegated to districts which, by reason of the method of construction, are worse ventilated than any others. They are deprived of all means of cleanliness of water itself, since pipes are laid only when paid for, and the rivers so polluted that they are useless for such purposes. They are obliged to throw all awful and garbage, all dirty water, often all disgusting drainage and excrement into the streets being without other means of disposing them. They are thus compelled to infect the region of their own dwellings. Frederick Engels, 1844. In the 1800s, hygiene and sanitation did not exist for most. Clean water, proper sewage treatment, and fresh air did not exist in many areas. Without sanitary infrastructure, human and animal waste would flow into the streets, ending up in the local streams and rivers which also happened to be the people's primary water supply. Quote, As we passed along the reeking banks of the sewer, the sun shone up on a narrow slip of water. In the bright light it appeared the color of strong green tea and positively looked as solid as black marble in the shadow. Indeed, it was more like watery mud than muddy water. And yet we were assured this was the only water the wretched inhabitants had to drink. 
As we gazed in horror at it, we saw drains and sewers emptying their filthy contents into it. We saw whole tiers of doorless privies in the open road, common to men and women, built over it. We heard bucket after bucket of filth splash into it. Henry Mayhew, 1849 The 1800s was a century people put in 12 to 16 hour a day at the most tedious menial labor. Overwork combined with abysmal housing, lack of sanitation, and poor nutrition aged the working poor so they looked old by their 30s and 40s. Children as young as four years old worked in factories and mines. Due to the extreme working conditions, long hours, revolting environments, little rest, poor nutrition, the resulting health of children was deplorable. Their weakened constitution left them extremely susceptible to diseases of all types. Quote, children of all ages down to three and four were found in the hardest and most painful labor, while babies of six were commonly found in large numbers in many factories. Labor from 12 to 13 and often 16 hours a day was the rule. Children had not a moment free to save to snatch a hasty meal or sleep as best as they could. From earliest youth, they worked to a point of extreme exhaustion, without open air exercise or any enjoyment whatever, but grew up, if they survived at all, weak, bloodless, miserable, in many cases deformed cripples and victims of almost every disease. An Introduction to the Industrial and Social History of England, 1920. Quote, children are pale, thin, delicate, feeble, stunted in growth, more than usually susceptible to certain formidable diseases, and much less able than common to resist the ordinary causes of disease. The prevailing complaints are general weakness, often amounting to fainting, pains in the head, side, back, and loins, palpitations, sickness, vomiting, and loss of appetite, curvature of the spine, scrofula, and consumption. Physical and moral condition of the children and young persons employed in mines and manufactures, 1843. Note that there was a disease called consumption because it withered away and consumed its victims. This was later officially named tuberculosis. The limited sources of food consumed by the population were often of poor quality or contaminated. A lack of laws or unenforced laws and a systematically corrupt food supply chain led to an abysmal health situation for those eating diseased food. In Chicago and New York, milk was of such poor quality that it caused the deaths of thousands of children each year. Quote, the dead meat markets are contaminated by the carcasses of diseased animals from all sources. In the city markets alone, his inspector seized from one to two tons of diseased meat every week. And similar seizures, but to a less extent, are made in the butcher's shops and slaughterhouses outside the city of the medical officers of health and their assistants. In Edinburgh, Mr. Gamgee tells us that 100 to 200 diseased cattle are sold in the dead meat markets every week, carcasses being smuggled in by night, even from adjoining piggeries. In this way, the best butchers in their ignorance may and do serve diseased meat to the wealthiest in the land. Pigs are largely fed upon diseased meat, which is too far gone even for the sausage maker, and this is saying a great deal. And as a universal rule, diseased pigs are pickled and cured for bacon and ham, etc. The British and Foreign Medical Surgical Review, Quarterly Journal of Practical Medicine and Surgery, 1865. Quote, for it was the custom, as they found, whenever meat was so spoiled that it could not be used for anything else, either to can it or else chop it up into sausage. There was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage, there would come all the way back from Europe old sausage that had been rejected, and that was moldy and white. It would be dosed with borax and glycerin and dumped into hoppers and made over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled onto the floor in the dirt and sawdust where the workers had trampled and spit uncounted billions of consumption germs. There would be meat stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip over it and thousands of rats would race up about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hands over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die, and then the rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. The Jungle, Upton Sinclair, 1906. 
The famous London fog was not a low-lying cloud of water vapor. In fact, the London fog was made up of soot and smoke spewed into the air by the massive amount of coal being burned. In 1902, the daily smoke that went up household chimneys and was emitted by the 14,500 factories in London was estimated a total of 7 million tons. The sunshine that reached London streets was a fraction of what it was in the countryside, often keeping the city dark and miserable. Between 1800 and 1900, air pollution may have killed people in Great Britain at a rate four to seven times the rate it killed people worldwide. Putting all these factors together, it's really not a surprise that people were so susceptible to every virus or bacteria that came along. To address public health concerns, local governments began setting standards to protect human health. Social reformers, activists, doctors, and others pushed for changes to improve the general well-being of the population. Governments began to focus on the removal of waste, supplying the people with clean water, and a whole host of other issues dealing with health. This all started in the mid to late 1800s. From that point through the mid 1900s, many dramatic improvements all slowly evolved, transforming our society from one of misery to one that we have today. All infectious disease death rates dramatically fell at all about the same time. All these numerous changes vastly improved the environment and human health. Quote, it is not strange that health improves when the population gives up using diluted sewage as the principal beverage. Dr. Thurman Rice, 1932. So we have pipes and sewers, hand washing, removing dreadful slums, moving industries away from the population, pasteurization, breastfeeding, union labor laws, child labor laws, public schools, health departments proper food handling, improved nutrition, scientific advancements such as electricity, refrigeration, transportation, the flush toilet, and mitigating pollution. We had gone from a health-destroying environment to one that promoted health and well-being. It was an incredible life and health revolution, and we've mostly forgotten about this today. By the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, life had changed radically for the better for many in the Western world. By that time, the deplorable housing, abysmal sanitary conditions, nutritionally deficient, often diseased food, child labor, terrible pollution that made life horrid, which had happened only a few short decades earlier, were not even a distant memory. We are not just a human body made up of human cells. Our bodies are actually composed of trillions of human cells and in even more microbes, bacteria, fungi, etc. Trillions of them. Together, all of them work together to provide a healthy human system. All those societal-wide changes that millions of people worked on change the environment outside and inside our bodies. Because our immune system proved microbes that were once deadly, scarlet fever, smallpox, measles, weren't as much of a threat. Death of all infectious diseases declined, and in some cases reaching zero or near zero. Quote, the microbiota plays a fundamental role on the induction training and function of the host immune system. In return, the immune system has largely evolved as a means to maintain the symbiotic relationship of the host with these highly diverse and evolving microbes. That's from the journal Cell, March 2014. One measure in improving nutrition is measuring the deaths from scurvy, severe vitamin C deficiency. The deaths from scurvy decreased at the same time as the fall in mortality of infectious diseases. The measles virus and all their microbes really didn't change. The environment, including human health, changed. Our immune system was slowly getting stronger and healthier. That's why all infectious disease deaths declined at the same time. So I realized that I had been looking at these infectious disease charts in a way that was too simplistic. It was really the wrong way to look at things. Instead of looking at it as a measles mortality chart, it's really an overall immune system health with a measles challenge chart. Everything that impacted the environment and immune system was represented in that chart. We had only been focused on a single microbe as a cause of death when in reality it was much more complicated than that. Get this combination infectious disease chart a second time, we can look at it for what it really is. It's a state of environmental, societal, and individual health and how these work together against various bacterial and viral challenges. Again, this is a different and I feel more accurate way to look at infectious diseases. 
the 1800s way of looking at humans as hapless entities in the environment is wrong. We are part of the environment, and how we take care of our surroundings and ourselves is critical. Making all those changes resulted in a phenomenal improvement in health from the 1800s into the mid-1900s. It was the world's greatest health revolution. Over the last year, COVID-19 has virtually taken over the minds of many across the planet. It has induced a great deal of fear as the media, public officials, and politicians almost exclusively repeat daily cases and deaths. The induced panic has resulted in some thinking this is the end of the world, or at least the worst thing that has ever happened. An incredibly panicked man I ran into one day during a walk outside told me, this is the deadliest virus ever. You could feel the fear spilling out of him. In this part, I'd like to share some information that provides a different perspective and hopefully helps take down people's fear level. Some have made comparisons of COVID-19 to the flu. What I want to show you is how it compares to historical data. Again, all the sources I'm using can be found and cross-checked, so you can do your own research. Here are some of the data used in the following charts. The area marked in red shows you the years 1910 to 1923 mortality rate for flu and pneumonia. You can see the deaths from flu and pneumonia were extremely high in those years. Again, all data is normalized to a data rate of X per 100,000. Here are the official CDC weekly statistics for COVID-19 I accessed on November 12, 2020. We want to normalize things to mortality per 100,000 for comparison. Dividing the total number by the United States population gives us a current number of 62 per 100,000. Because this was November and not the end of the year, and some people think the numbers are way too low and some say way too high, I used a somewhat arbitrary range of 150,000 to 300,000. That's the yellowish box on the chart. It shows that our current epidemic is about the same as influenza was from 1933 to 1945. COVID-19 is nowhere near the level of the early 1900s and definitely not near the 1918 often quoted flu pandemic. I put a line at 1938 where the rate was 80.2, which would be the rate if COVID-19 deaths hit about 263,000 for the year. Now, this doesn't lessen the severity of what we're going through at the present, but it shows that it's not a new unprecedented world-ending virus. Flu pneumonia was a giant killer in the first part of the 1900s, even if you don't count 1918. It is little doubt that it was even worse before 1900, but we just don't have data back then. We survived as a country and a planet despite these horribly high numbers. Interestingly, if you watch documentaries about the early 1900s into the 1940s, these deaths are rarely, if ever, mentioned. In general, it seems people lived their lives as best they could without apparent complete panic over it. Again, every year before 1938 had a higher flu pneumonia mortality rate than the present situation. In the case of 1900 or 1920, the mortality rate was two and a half times worse. For example, to be equal to 1900, the number of deaths would be about 650,000. Here is the same data using a bar chart and assuming COVID-19 at 263,000 equal to the flu pneumonia of 1938. When people say COVID-19 is comparable to the flu, they would be correct and actually not as bad if you're talking about before 1940. Again, this is not to minimize today's deaths, but only to provide a historical context. People's lives didn't crumble and fall apart during the 1800s into the first part of the 1900s. If anything, overall Western society was transformed and thrived. Here are some of the worst and horrible death tolls in relatively recent history as a comparison. Again, although serious, COVID-19 is not the worst event in human history. When we put the age ranges of people recorded as dying from COVID-19, it becomes quite clear that the risk for under 25 years old is minimal and even under 45 years old. In the age range of 0 to 24, you can see relative risk with other causes of death that we had in 2018. The flu pneumonia is worse, assaults are 11 times worse, suicide is 14 times worse, accidents are 30 times worse. So does it make sense at all to shut down all schools and universities? Does it make sense to prevent children from playing together? Does it make sense for young people not to get together and enjoy their young lives? Keep in mind that with suicide, those are 2018 statistics. Suicide during the age of COVID induced fear 
looks like it will be much higher. There will almost certainly be far more suicides because of how things have been handled with this disease than the actual COVID-19 deaths. 25 to 34 year olds, heart disease and cancer two times worse, homicide three times worse, suicide four and a half times worse, unintentional injury 15 times worse. Looking at the last two charts, does it make sense for anyone under 35 to be so terrified of this virus? Sure, it is a big problem, but is it the utter world-ending disaster it has been made out to be? For people 35 to 44, suicide one and a half times worse, heart disease and cancer more than two times worse, unintentional injury more than five times worse. People 45 to 54, unintentional injury two times worse, heart disease almost three times worse, cancer over three times worse. These age charts show that if you're younger, there's not a huge amount of risk. When you get into the older, and I'll show increasingly unhealthy, that's when the real significant amount of serious consequences has happened. Death is a part of life. When I tell people that about 54 to 55,000 people die each week in the United States on average, they often seem quite shocked. The official leading causes of death are cancer and heart disease, and yet they don't seem to be emphasized by the media and politicians as continuously as COVID-19 has been. Sure, we know people die, but it just doesn't seem like it happens every day, which it does. In 2018, over 1.2 million people died of cancer and heart disease, or almost 3,500 every day. Sadly, many of these deaths are preventable through lifestyle changes. Imagine if these deaths were reported daily across the media, but we don't because we are used to these deaths. They are part of our reality, so we accept and largely don't think about them. What is in kept track of by the CDC is how many people die due to medical error. The medical coding system was designed to maximize billing for physician services, not to collect national health statistics. Medical related deaths just aren't tracked. Various studies have put this at a huge annual number. An article in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2000 estimated the number at 225,000 to 284,000. This disturbing number makes it the third leading cause of death. What's amazing is that there was and still is no outcry by the media, medical professionals, or politicians about these deaths. Another more recent study puts the number of hospital-caused deaths each year at over 250,000, or about 9.5% of all deaths. That's almost 1 in 10 deaths, again, the third leading cause of death. A study in the Journal of Patient Safety puts this number even higher at over 400,000 per year, with 10 to 20 times more experience serious harm. That equals almost 1,100 deaths every day from hospitals. Again, I never hear anything about this from the media, politicians, or public health officials. Also keep in mind that these deaths have been counted as other deaths, heart disease, cancer, flu, etc., and now no doubt COVID-19. Some of these deaths that have been labeled as heart disease, cancer, COVID-19, etc., are really hospital-caused deaths. Acquiring infections in hospitals, doctors' offices, nursing homes is a huge problem. Sadly, this makes sense. If you put sick people together in one place, they will spread the infection around a lot more than a regular public setting. This is another huge problem that hasn't been addressed. About 100,000 people die every year because of this, one of the leading causes of death. Quote, 1.7 million Americans develop hospital-acquired infections each year, and 99,000 die of hospital-acquired infections annually. Three-fourths of the infections start in places like nursing homes and doctor's offices. In 2012, antibiotic-resistant MRSA infection killed more Americans than emphysema, HIV-AIDS, Parkinson's disease, and homicide combined. Healthline, July 2013. Those are four separate studies talking about the risk of patients in hospitals. There are also other cases that showed how companies can be ruthless when their profits are at stake. In this case, Merck had to pay out about 100000 per death. Not bad for the cost of doing business. This reveals the dark underbelly of the large companies that stand to make huge profits on pharmaceuticals. Quote, Dr. Graham, Associate Director of Science for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Office of Drug Safety, and colleagues estimate that during the five years Vioxx was sold in the United States, it caused between 88,000 and 140,000 excess cases of serious heart disease. The researchers estimate that close to half of those cases, or 44%, would have resulted in fatalities. 
This means anywhere from 39,000 to 61,000 deaths in the United States could be linked to Vioxx. Globe and Mail, 2005. Quote, Merck made a hit list of doctors who criticized Vioxx. The list emailed between Merck employees contained doctors' names with the labels neutralize, neutralized, or discredit next to them. Merck emails from 1999 showed company execs complaining about doctors who disliked using Vioxx. One email said, we may have to seek them out and destroy them where they live. CBS News 2009. Quote, Researchers have alleged that Merck knew of the dangers years earlier, but tweaked statistics and hid data so that regulars remained in the dark. CBS News 2008. Previous studies don't include the people that die from taking prescription drugs. By one estimate, 128,000 die each year from taking properly prescribed medications. Nearly 60 to 70 percent of us take at least one prescribed drug. There is no formal process for quantifying injuries, hospitalizations, or even deaths caused by therapeutic drug use, which excludes overdose or misuse. Estimates dating back nearly two decades put the number at 100,000 or more annual deaths, which includes a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1998 that projected 106,000 deaths. A more recent analysis estimates 128,000 Americans die each year as a result of taking medications as prescribed. By far the greatest number of prescription drug-related hospitalizations and deaths occur from drugs that are prescribed properly by physicians and taken as directed. About 2,460 people per week are estimated to die from drugs that were properly prescribed. The estimate, which didn't include those who died as a result of prescribing errors, overdose, or self-medication, would make taking properly prescribed drugs the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. U.S. News and World Report 2016. Something we often don't pay any attention to is that pollution is estimated to kill 9 million people a year. A shocking one in six deaths on the planet is due to pollution. Across the United States, more people are dying from deaths of despair, which is suicide, drug and alcohol poisoning, and alcoholic liver disease than at any other point in recorded history, according to the CDC. White working class people ages 45 to 54 were drinking themselves to death with alcohol, accidentally sh overdosing on opioids and other drugs, and killing themselves, often by shooting or hanging. Vanishing jobs, disintegrating families, and other social stressors has unleashed a rising tide of fatal despair. 181,000 deaths of despair each year is a shocking number, and that is before the tragedy of how we have handled COVID-19, which is set to make the number skyrocket. Now, looking at these leading causes of death, we can see that we have many serious problems that we are hardly paying any attention to this year. Note that the pink bars are estimates since they aren't being counted. That also means that deaths counted as something else, heart disease, flu, etc., might be part of those numbers. It starts to get complicated to decide which category because people usually really die for multiple reasons. Historically, we saw that our current predicament is not unique. The flu pneumonia of at least the first half of the 1900s was just as deadly and in many cases two and a half times worse. Young people under 25 are really not at substantial risk of death from COVID-19. Unfortunately, there are other, more likely ways people are killed, some of which are likely to worsen from the fall of how we have reacted to this virus. Overall, deaths from heart disease, cancer, and medically caused deaths, and globally pollution are more significant threats we are, aren't focused on. I'll show later, deaths of despair may eventually exceed the deaths from the virus itself. COVID-19 cases and deaths all hinge on a new PCR test to supposedly detect this specific virus. Almost everyone assumes it meets the highest level of scientific validity, but does it? This paper written by 22 doctors and scientists seriously challenges the validity of this test. This paper gets very technical and beyond my rudimentary understanding of PCR. I imagine only a very few people in the world really understand this technology. So I can't judge just how accurate they are, or for that matter, the original paper. But the authors here are very clear. They state that the original report that established the PCR test for this new virus is flawed and needs to be immediately retracted. Quote, in the publication entitled Detection of 2019 Novel 
uh, coronavirus by real-time PCR. The authors present a diagnostic workflow and protocol for detection and diagnostics of uh, 2019 NCOV in light of all the consequences resulting from this very publication for societies worldwide a group of independent researchers performed a point-by-point -point review of the aforesaid uh, publication the published protocol for detection and diagnostics of covid and the manuscript suffer from numerous technical and scientific errors neither the presented test nor the manuscript itself fulfills the requirements of an acceptable scientific publication we provide compelling evidence of several scientific inadequacies, errors, and flaws. Considering the scientific and methodological blemishes presented here, we are confident that the editorial board of the Euro Surveillance has no other choice but to retract the publication. Quote, this paper will show numerous serious flaws in the original paper, the significance of which has led to worldwide misdiagnosis of infections attributed to SARS-CoV-2 and associated with the disease COVID-19. We are confronted with, a st with stringent lockdowns, which have destroyed many people's lives and livelihoods, limited access to education, and these in imposed restrictions by governments around the world are a direct attack on people's basic rights and their free personal freedoms, resulting in collateral damage for entire economies on a global scale. There are 10 fatal problems with the original paper, which we will outline and explain in great detail in the following sections. Neither control material of infectious live or inactivated SARS-CoV-2 nor isolated genomic RNA of the virus was available to the authors. The focus here should be placed upon the two stated aims, development and deployment of a diagnostic test for use in public health laboratory settings. These aims are, aims are not achievable without having an actual virus material available. Validation was only done in regards to theoretical sequences and within the laboratory setting and not as required for in vitro diagnostics with isolated genomic viral RNA. This very fact hasn't changed even after 10 months of introduction of the test into routine diagnostics. The paper itself already signifies that a large number of false positive results are generated by this test even under controlled laboratory conditions make it completely unsuitable as a reliable virus screening method for entire populations in an ongoing pandemic. Given the far-reaching implications, including quarantine, measures, lockdowns, curfews, and impacts on education, etc., this paper must be immediately retracted. The number of amplification cycles, less than 35, preferably 25 to 30 cycles, in cases of virus detection, greater than 35 cycles only detect signals which do not correlate with infectious virus as determined by isolation in cell culture. If someone is tested by PCR as positive, when a threshold of 35 cycles or higher is used, as is the case in most laboratories in Europe and the U.S., the probability that said person is actually infected is less than 3%. The probability that this, the result is a false positive is 97%. Consequently, in nearly all test procedures worldwide, merely two primer matches were used instead of all three. This oversight renders the entire test protocol useless with regards to delivering accurate test results of real significance in an ongoing pandemic. Quote, these are severe design errors since the test cannot discriminate between whole virus and viral fragments. The test cannot be used as a diagnostics for SARS-CoV-2 viruses. The design errors presented here are so severe that it is highly unlikely the specific application of SARS-CoV-2 genetic material will occur using the protocol of the original paper. The fact that these PCR products have not been validated at molecular level is another striking error of the protocol, making any test based upon it useless as a specific diagnostic tool to identify SARS-CoV-2 virus. A positive real-time PCR test merely indicates the presence of viral RNA molecules. The original test was not designed to detect full-length virus, but only fragment of the virus. We 
already concluded that this classifies the test as unsuitable as a diagnostic test for SARS virus infection. In light of our re-examination of the test protocol to identify SARS-CoV-2 described in the original paper, we have identified concerning errors and inherent fallacies which render the SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR test useless. Here are the authors of that paper. That paper is simply shocking. I believe there should be an immediate review by a group of independent scientists. They should report their findings in a public setting to resolve whether all these COVID-19 cases are at all legitimate. In November 2020, a Portuguese appeals court has ruled that PCR tests are unreliable and that it's unlawful to quarantine people based solely on a PCR test. Quote, Given how much scientific doubt exists as voiced by experts, i.e. those who matter, about the reliability of the PCR tests, given the lack of information concerning the test analytical parameters and the absence of a physician's diagnosis supporting the existence of infection or risk, there is no way this court would ever be able to determine whether a person was indeed a carrier of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Here is the actual court transcript. Apparently, the number of cycles in PCR is critical. It seems the number of cycles should be less than 25 and greater than 35 is worthless. Most laboratories in the USA and Europe use 35 or more cycles, making all their tests invalid. So all those cases and deaths reported as COVID-19 might all be based on an utterly invalid test. All the lockdowns, mass orders, destruction of economies, panic, fear, and many other horribly adverse uh, effects may be based on a flawed test. This may be one of the biggest and destructive scientific blunders in human history. I show that measles deaths aren't really caused just by a virus. There are many factors. This new virus isn't some type of unique super virus. I believe this problem just happened to come along at the right point in history. There are many factors, just like there were before the mid-1900s with those historical diseases, that have set the stage for our present-day problems. We are in a major global epidemic of obesity. Since the 1970s and really taking off in the 1980s, more and more Americans have become heavier and heavier. Today, 40% of American adults are obese and 7.7% morbidly obese. That's about 50% obese or worse. Only 30%, one-third of Americans are of normal weight. Being a normal weight is now the exception. And a projected obesity rate of 50% is nothing short of a colossal disaster. Obesity isn't about if you're a good person or if you're attractive. It's linked to severe health risks, including heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. Since the 1970s, as a nation, we've gotten sicker and sicker. We are a very ill society. The people from the 1970s seem like they're from another planet where almost everyone was thin. Over the last 40 years or so, we have transformed our society from relative health to grossly unhealthy. While the United States leads the obesity epidemic explosion, the rest of the Western world is falling right behind. No country is nearly as unhealthy as the United States, but other countries have been slowly increasing. England and Australia are right behind the USA. This is not a competition anyone should want to win. As a society, we have let this happen to ourselves. Access to 24-7 junk food and massively increased portions have helped fuel this obesity epidemic. Despite spending enormous sums of money and resources on health care, people in the United States live the shortest, almost four years with comparable countries, and five and a half with Japan. That should tell us all something. I would argue that it's because we are the most unhealthy. Yes, many people eat well and exercise, but as an overall society, we're just not doing well. This probably helps explain why in the United States about 80% of deaths from COVID-19 are are over 65, and in Europe it is 91%. Obesity is tied not only to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer, it's also linked to a higher frequency of upper and lower respiratory tract infections. COVID-19 is a respiratory infection. Quote, compared to individuals with normal weight, obese individuals reported a consistently higher frequency of upper and lower RTIs, which is respiratory tract infections. 
obesity belongs to one of the host risk factors for RTI and is possibly an emerging role due to the dramatically increasing prevalence of obesity worldwide. And really unsurprisingly, obesity is a risk factor for severe outcomes in COVID-19. So how does obesity impact the outcome of COVID-19? Obesity itself creates an underlying systemic inflammation. When COVID-19 comes along, it magnifies the problem that already exists. Quote, Obesity is one of the three greatest risk factors for suffering the most serious consequences of COVID-19. Obesity creates an underlying inflammatory condition, one that very likely exacerbates the inflammation caused by SARS-CoV-2 infection, one of the leading causes of COVID-19 disease. According to the CDC, 94% of people that died with COVID-19 had, on average, 2.6 additional conditions. So for the most part, not healthy people at all. Even back in April of 2020, a study showed that the, that the uh, bad outcomes from this virus were linked to age and other serious health problems. NCDs or non communicable diseases are a number of diseases. The main types of NCDs include cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, and diabetes. Again, of those that the CDC tracked that have died of COVID-19, only 6% did not have other major health conditions. The medical journal The Lancet warns of a perfect storm created by COVID-19 virus, with the continued rise in chronic illnesses and associated risk factors such as obesity and high blood sugar. If there wasn't such a massive increase in these sick conditions, it seems COVID-19 wouldn't have been the major issue that it is turned into. Quote, the risk factors contributing to the dramatic rise in NCDs in recent decades have been known for a long time, but the COVID-19 pandemic has brutally exposed our collective failure to deal with them. NCDs have been critical in driving the death toll from the virus. Many, but not all, of the risk factors leading to these NCDs are preventable and treatable through changes in unhealthy behaviors. Tackling them will bring us enormous social and economic benefits. Good nutrition is the common key in reducing the risk of NCDs, even Alzheimer's, for which there is no cure. Recent studies cited by the World Health Organization indicate that people can lower the risk of dementia by eating a healthy diet, as well as by taking regular exercise, not smoking, and avoiding harmful use of alcohol. So as an analogy, imagine a lovely middle-class 1950s to 1970s neighborhood. Then imagine over time that no one maintains their properties and, and the homes. Today it's overgrown with weeds and dried up bushes. The houses themselves are falling apart and are filled with enormous amounts of junk and flammable material. A few homes appear to be reasonably well maintained, but they are increasingly in the minority. Then a fire breaks out and rips through the neighborhood. Would anyone be surprised? Tobacco causes 8 million deaths every year from cardiovascular disease, lung disorders, cancers, diabetes, and hypertension. Smoking tobacco is also known as a risk factor for severe disease and death from respiratory infections. It isn't surprising that damaging your lung function and overall health would make you more likely to have severe consequences to COVID-19. PM 2.5, or particulate matter measuring 2.5 microns in diameter or less, is a major source of adverse health effects, including heart disease, and this is all found in air pollution. When people inhale polluted air, the very small polluting particles, the PM 2.5, migrate from the lungs to the blood and blood vessels, causing inflammation and severe oxidative stress damaging our bodies. As mentioned, air pollution is responsible for 9 million deaths, so it's not surprising that depending on how polluted the region you live in, is a factor in COVID-19 deaths. Quote, up to 15% of COVID-19 deaths globally and 18% of fatalities caused by the virus in the United States may be linked to long-term exposure to air pollution. And an analysis published Monday by the journal Cardiovascular Research estimated this means that air pollution may have played a role in roughly 40,000 of the more than 220,000 deaths attributed to the coronavirus nationally. A large number of people are vitamin D deficient. Quote, most patients had vitamin D levels that were less than those currently recommended for optimal health. Furthermore, very severe and severe forms accounted for up to 43%. Quote, low levels of 
25-hydroxyvitamin D, the principal circulating storage form of vitamin D, are present in one-third to one-half of otherwise healthy, middle-aged to elderly adults. I have a friend that is terrified of being out in the sun because she's afraid of skin cancer. I tried to explain the importance of vitamin D in sunshine, but there was nothing I could say to her. I even offered to give her supplements for free. She refused because her doctor didn't say she should take them. For many years, nonstop calls for sunscreen and staying out of the sun had planted the sphere of the sun into people's minds. As a result, not surprisingly, we have a population deficient in vitamin D. Vitamin D isn't magic. It, along with other nutrients, is what the body needs to function correctly. When we get sunshine and supplement vitamin D, we're just putting into our bodies what should have been there. Quote, obesity is an important factor because cells absorb vitamin D and keep it from circulating throughout the bloodstream. People with darker skin pigmentation have, built, have a built-in natural sunscreen called melanin which keeps the skin from synthesizing vitamin D. Women have lower vitamin D levels than men for a few possible reasons. Women tend to have more body fat than men, they spend a bit more time indoors, and tend to wear hats and sunscreen more often than men. Age also plays a role in vitamin D deficiency because as people get older, they absorb less vitamin D from their diet and produce less vitamin D in their skin. Also, their reduced activity gives them less opportunity to be outdoors. If you live farther away from the equator, you aren't exposed to enough ultraviolet light so your body is unable to make vitamin D from November to February. Oh, sunlight doesn't actually provide you with vitamin D, rather your body produces vitamin D when skin is exposed to the sun's ultraviolet rays which trigger vitamin D synthesis. The liver and kidneys convert this biologically inert form of vitamin D into biologically active forms the body can use. Sunlight consists of both, both ultraviolet A and, or UVA or ultraviolet B or UVB. It's the UVB rays that trigger the synthesis of vitamin D. You can't get adequate UVB exposure sitting indoors or in a car. Virtually all commercial and automobile glass blocks UVB rays. As a result, you will not be able to increase your vitamin D levels by sitting in front of a sunny window, though much of the UVA radiation will penetrate the glass and may be harmful. It doesn't matter if it's winter or summer, you will make no vitamin D sitting in front of a window zip said Dr. Michael Hollick, a professor of medicine, physiology, and biophysics at Boston University School of Medicine. With all the lockdown orders and people staying indoors, it wouldn't be surprising to see people's vitamin D levels being even worse today. I know of one person that never left their house all summer, five months, when people get the most sunlight and make large amounts of vitamin D. Lower vitamin D levels means more deaths from infections, heart disease, and cancer. So was staying inside for months on end a smart strategy? Vitamin D was shown to cut the risk of respiratory infections in half. That's just an incredible result just by supplementing with vitamin D. Quote, our analysis has also found that vitamin D helps the body fight acute respiratory infections, which is responsible for millions of deaths globally each year the investigators found that daily or weekly supplementation had the greatest benefit for individuals with the most significant vitamin D deficiency, cutting their risk of respiratory infections in half, and that all participants experienced some beneficial effects from regular vitamin D supplementation. Analyzing patient data from 10 countries, researchers found a strong correlation between vitamin D deficiency and COVID-19 mortality rates. Their analysis showed that mortality rates could be reduced as much as 50%. The researchers also discovered a strong correlation between vitamin D levels and a cytokine storm. A cytokine storm is a hyperinflammatory condition caused by an overactive immune system. Quote, cytokine storm can severely damage lungs and lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome and death in patients. This is what seems to kill the majority of COVID-19 patients, not the destruction of the lungs by the virus itself. It is the complications from the misdirected fire from the immune system. Our analysis shows that it is healthy levels of vitamin D might be as high as cutting the mortality rate in half. 
It will not prevent a patient from contracting the virus, but it may reduce complications and prevent death in those who are infected. It is clear that vitamin D deficiency is harmful and can be easily addressed with appropriate supplementation. This might be another key to help protect vulnerable populations such as African Americans and elderly patients who have a prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. Sadly, there were no immediate calls for everyone to supplement with vitamin D, especially the elderly, the overweight, and people with darker skin. We could have dramatically handled this problem early as well as improving overall health. It would have been a cheap, extremely low risk, and effective strategy. While vitamin D deficiency is tied to infections, these few articles show astounding results in addressing this underlying problem. Positive impacts on heart disease and a 50% reduction in colon and breast cancer with vitamin D supplements. The fallout of supplementing with vitamin D for the entire population would have not only halved all respiratory deaths, but dropped deaths from so many conditions. Imagine the end of 2020 with half the COVID-19 flu, cancer, and heart disease deaths. As I mentioned earlier, hospital-related harms and hospital-acquired infections have been a problem for a long time, so it's not surprising that a certain amount of medically-induced harm happened during COVID-19, especially during the initial panic-filled and chaotic months of April and May when deaths were very high. Quote, a frontline nurse working in New York on coronavirus patients claims the city is killing sufferers by putting them on ventilators. It's a horror movie, she said through her friend, not because of the disease, but the way it's being handled. New York emergency room doctor Cameron Kyle Sedell said, I talk to doctors all around the country and it's becoming increasingly clear that the pressure we're providing may be hurting their lungs. It is highly likely that the high pressure we are using are damaging the lungs of the patients we are putting the breathing tubes in. He stepped down from working in the intensive care at Mamamides Medical Center in Brooklyn because he didn't want to follow the hospital's ventilator protocol. I could not morally in a patient-doctor relationship continue the current protocols which again are the protocols of the top hospitals in the country. To keep the same gowns and masks on because the theory is that all patients on a COVID-19 floor will already have the virus, but she says that is faulty logic as some are there to see if the coronavirus can be ruled out. So even if they rule out COVID-19 and they're not COVID-19, then they're going to get COVID because they're using the same PPE all shift and they're all carrying that contamination to all the patients. If you go into a crowded movie theater and yell fire, you might mean well, but the resultant panic may kill a lot of people. Instead, a calm, logical approach of solely evacuating the theater would be the way to save the most lives. In the spring of 2020, the media, politicians, and others were screaming fire in that crowded movie theater. People rushed to the hospitals, and the result was chaos. Of course, if you had significant breathing problems, you should have gone. But many others, from what I was told, didn't need to run to the hospitals. Not only did that overload hospitals, but you can imagine just how many then acquired a virus from being in a place with lots of sick people magnifying the problem. How many deaths could be attributed to how we treated this virus and exposed those who didn't have the virus to the virus? Hundreds? Thousands? Tens of thousands? I have no idea really, but it should be carefully examined to learn from any mistakes that were made. This is a statement from a nurse friend of mine who has over 20 years of experience. She doesn't want to use her name for fear of retribution from the medical community and possibly losing her job. I am an RN navigator, a nurse with over 20 years experience. I worked at two major hospitals in the beginning of 2020. My role is reviewing patients in the hospital to assist with discharge planning. Beginning in March 2020, the patients I reviewed with COVID-19 diagnosis were not provided the basic fundamental respiratory support which had proven effective for many years. I was surprised that the medical establishment's protocol was to deny patients the use of nebulization and CPAP BiPAP respiratory support because of the fear of spreading the virus. These modalities have been the basic treatment for anyone with dyspnea, dyspnea shortness of breath, or tightened airways like asthma attack. Nebulization improves most um, shortness of breath within 
minutes, and CPAP and BiPAP are pressurized air to assist lung function. Instead, it was decided by the powers that be to put anyone who had difficulty breathing on a ventilator. A ventilator is more invasive, uses stronger pressure to force lungs to function, and are known to damage lung tissue with extended use. Today, ventilators are being used less often. BiPAP and CPAP are being used sparingly. Nebulization is still not allowed to be used in the hospital setting unless the patient is in negative pressure in the airflow room. These types of rooms are very limited in hospitals. Patients who were denied these treatments, some not only died, but had longer periods of illness with increased patient suffering. I was devastated and appalled at the choices the medical community had taken. I was deeply saddened and extremely disappointed with the medical field overall and I wondered how I could continue as an RN. The current strategy is for everyone to isolate indefinitely until a vaccine is ready. Isolation is staying at home, keeping your distance, or masking. It's all predicated on a vaccine fixes everything strategy. It doesn't matter if you are young, healthy, and at very low risk. That's a one size fits all for everyone. Until the next virus comes along, then we'll do the exact same thing. By the way, we know 80% of people who get sick with COVID-19 have no to mild symptoms and recover at home or didn't even know they had it. The lesson of history teaches that when we make positive changes to our environment and our health that we had made from the late 1800s to the mid 1900s, the hold that infectious diseases have over us plummets. But since the 1970s, our societies have become increasingly unhealthy, slowly undoing the gains we had made. It's like health-wise, we went back f backwards 40 years instead of forward since the late 1970s, and now we're experiencing a 1938 flu pneumonia equivalent number of deaths. The solution is not a vaccine for a specific virus or for everyone to isolate themselves, but to address the major underlying issues that we as a society have let take over. We as a society have unwittingly set ourselves up for this problem. We can change it. Also, in my opinion, we have as a society have largely given over the control of our health to others, creating a massive medical system. I just heard on a podcast the other day that if you get sick, you go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. I would say most of the time you need to get your health in order and not rely on someone else to fix a problem. Many health problems could be prevented or easily managed by yourself. We need a society where your health is your responsibility. I think by providing this crutch for every issue, we become lazy, thinking someone else is going to fix things when they go wrong. And a lot of things that are going wrong are because we aren't eating right, not exercising, not learning how to manage minor issues. Like measles, deaths are not just from measles. COVID-19 trigger deaths are from a various factors that we can address. We must do that today. If we don't, the next virus that rips across the globe will be even worse than COVID-19 as obesity and chronic health conditions continue to escalate. If we ignore obesity, vitamin D levels, etc., really our overall health, then the next virus might be more on par with the 1900 flu pneumonia, which would be 650,000 deaths, or even worse, the 1918 flu pneumonia, which was, would be equivalent to 2 million deaths. Instead, here are some of the things to do to empower each and every one of us. These steps won't just be against a single virus, but will help with all infectious diseases as well as heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, etc. We already talked about vitamin A and D and C and cinnamon. I'd like to briefly share some other natural remedies that you can consider when you feel you are getting sick. I use many of these and I think they work remarkably well with no adverse effects. I think this quote by Voltaire is something we should think about. Quote, Doctors put drugs of which they know little into bodies which they know less for diseases which they know nothing at all. This article in the Canadian Family Physician Journal is nothing short of amazing and something we should all consider. Vitamin D daily and the vitamin D hammer when we feel a sickness coming on. Quote, a colleague of mine and I have introduced vitamin D at doses that have achieved greater than 100 nanomoles per liter in most of our patients for the past number of years. We now see very few patients in our clinic with a flu or influenza-like illness. 
In those patients who do have influenza, we have treated them with a vitamin D hammer as coined by my colleague. This one-time 50,000 IU dose of vitamin D3 or 10,000 IU three times daily for two to three days. The results are dramatic with complete resolution of symptoms in 48 to 72 hours. One-time doses of vitamin D at this level have been used safely and have never been shown to be toxic. We urgently need a study of this intervention. The cost of vitamin D is about a penny for 1,000 IUs, so this treatment costs less than a dollar. Cherry's garlic has been used to ward off sickness. It has been used for the common cold, high blood pressure, and the prevention of gangrene. It seems something so simple wouldn't have such an amazing success. Quote, vinegar and cider are both known to possess prophylactic and curative properties against smallpox. Dr. G. W. Harvey, 1901. Quote, any person who has been exposed need have no fear of smallpox if he will take two to three tablespoons of pure cider vinegar three to four times a day. The discussion may now be regarded as closed and smallpox at last is conquered. J.P. McLean, Ph.D., 1902. This article is about an incident that happened during the infamous flu pandemic of 1918. Silver in eyes and nose stopped cases from taking over the ship. Something to consider with the current virus. I just wanted to mention that a short while ago I woke up feeling not quite right. I had a scratchy throat, sniffly, and I knew I was coming down with a cold or something. I took 2 grams of vitamin C, 50 milligrams of zinc, some apple cider vinegar, a clove of garlic, some oil of oregano, and black seed oil. I also did the first day of the vitamin D hammer, 30,000 units. I laid back down and meditated. This is the first time I felt something from taking some nutrients. My arms and legs felt energized, which is the best way I could describe it. I felt it working. An hour later, I had no symptoms. None. Media, public officials, and politicians almost all have had a singular focus on COVID-19 cases and deaths. Deaths from other causes or other enormous blowbacks from their actions don't seem to enter into their thinking. From lockdowns to isolation to mass mandates all drive effects besides the ones they are focused on. I have to emphasize that a virus doesn't cause the following things. It's our reaction, our fear, that causes them. It's how we, as a collective society, have decided to react. When the media, politicians, or others report that the pandemic caused this or that, it didn't. It's how humans have reacted to the virus, and it was often out of almost complete panic. The following results are from those actions, which often traded COVID-19 related deaths for other deaths, or even created an environment more favorable for virus related deaths. Food program estimates the number of people experience crisis level hunger will rise to 270 million before the end of the year due to the pandemic, an 82% increase since 2019. This means between 6,000 to 12,000 people per day could die from hunger, linked to the social and economic impacts of the world reaction to the pandemic before the end of the year. Perhaps more than will die each day from the disease by that point. That means 2.1 to 4.3 million people could starve to death because of how the world has reacted. As often is the case, the poor will be disproportionately affected, suffering the consequences of how Westerners react. Quote, the panic surrounding the coronavirus is sweeping our world. The panic itself is making us more susceptible to its potential spread. You need emotional tools and practices to keep your immune system healthy to combat the disease. Your emotional health is intricately linked to your immune system. Your immune system is a collection of billions of cells and some target organs that have a primary job of keeping you healthy and fighting off disease. Your immune system cells travel throughout your body and defend it against antigens such as viruses. Unrelenting cortisol, your primary stress hormone, suppresses your immune system by reducing the number of virus-fighting cells. When stress, anxiety, worry, overwhelm, Depression and isolation are left unchecked. They actually reduce the effectiveness of your immune system and make you and those around you much more susceptible to getting sick. When your immune system is challenged, you are more likely to contract and spread a circulating virus and expose those around you, your communities, and our global population. 
Further, children may be especially prone to long-term damage to their immune systems through something called e early life stress, ELS. Children exposed to early life stress have shown long-term compromised immune systems, and children are especially sensitive to picking up the stress and anxiety of the adults around them. In terms of our children's ELS, we need to learn to calm down. Imagine you are in the jungle and you see a lion. Your fear kicks in. Chemicals pulse through your body, getting you ready to run or defend yourself. The flight or fight response. At the same time, your immune system, which isn't needed as your energy is being used to stay immediately alive, is suppressed. It's less capable of fighting off infections. Now imagine that threat is something you feel for months on end, as has happened with COVID-19. Your immune system is sidelined, and by being terrified, you are fulfilling your own fear. You've crippled your own innate defense system. You've made yourself more susceptible to the serious consequences of a virus. And as we scare the heck out of our children, we are compromising their long-term immunity. Our terror around our children and focus on death on a 24-7 basis is damaging their immune system over the long term. And in my opinion, through our fear and panic, we have utterly failed our children. By throwing our kids out of school, grade and universities, we have created a level of fear in them. Again, anyone under 25 is at very low risk, and if they followed some improved lifestyle changes to make them healthy, they would be at near zero risk. In my opinion, forcing them to wear masks and everyone around them creates a continuous feedback that everyone around them is a source of death. Quote, living under constant threat has serious health consequences. Physical health, fear weakens our immune system and can cause cardiovascular damage gastrointestinal problems, such as ulcers and uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and decreased fertility. It can lead to accelerated aging and even premature death. Memory. Fear can impair formation of long-term memories and can cause damage to certain parts of the brain, such as the hippocampus. This can make it even more difficult to regulate fear and can leave a person anxious most of the time. To someone in chronic fear, the world looks scary and their memories confirm that. Brain processing and reactivity. Fear can interrupt processes on our brain that allow us to regulate emotions, read nonverbal cues, and by the way, masking blocks these nonverbal cues, and other information presented to us. Re reflect before acting and act ethically. This impacts our thinking and decision making in negative ways, leaving us susceptible to intense emotions and impulsive reactions. All of these effects can leave us unable to act appropriately. Mental health, other consequences of long-term fear, includes fatigue, clinical depression, and PSTD. 24-7 fear pushed by the media and many politicians and other officials, it's no surprise there's an increase in depression. Quote, as many as twice as many adults in Britain are reporting symptoms of depression now compared with this time last year. One in five people appeared to have depressive symptoms compared to one in ten before the pandemic. Many people have suffered an enormous amount of depression from job losses, isolation, and the end of the world scenarios playing out almost continuously on the media for months. Quote, Many emotional reactions to the pandemic detected in surveys may reflect understandable demoralization and grief at painful losses of jobs, social contacts, and loved ones felt by the virus. Demoralization, involving experiencing a loss of meaning and purpose in life accompanied by frustration, anger, and a feeling that one is fighting a losing battle. Quote, more than a quarter of U.S. 18 to 24 year olds and nearly a third of caregivers for adults seriously considered suicide in June as the coronavirus pandemic continues to have a significant adverse impact on mental health. Suicide in 2018 was already at a high of 6,816 for 0 to 24 year olds, 14 times higher than the death rate for that age group for COVID-19. With 1 in 4 18 24 year olds seriously considering suicide, that number could skyrocket. According to the organization Wellbeing Trust, the reaction to the virus could drive up deaths of despair. The range is an increase from 27,000 at the low end to 154,000 at the high end. 
A dreadful baseline of 181,000 in 2018 could cause a rise to 335,000 in 2020, making it a death rate of um, 102.3, much higher than the COVID-19 itself. Our reaction to this virus, I have to emphasize this is an overall human response to the virus, has wrecked lives and part of the result is an escalation in murders. Something recently happened to me. I was at a local Thai restaurant picking up some food. The place was closed, but pickup was open. The food wasn't ready, so I stepped to the side and waited. I was reading some news on my phone 10 feet from the cashier, who, by the way, is behind a plexiglass shield and wearing a mask, and 10 feet from the door. A man came in and started commenting, Hey, buddy, there's a pandemic on. I really didn't pay attention, and as he ventured to the back of the restaurant somewhere. When he came back, he started yelling and cursing at me. After a few nasty words and comments, he started to leave. He was clearly beyond irate. Then he said, how about you come out in the parking lot and I break your neck? He was in a complete panic and rage. I was quite surprised, but remained where I was. He went out in the parking lot and he was pacing back and forth and throwing his arms around, making faces. He was clearly mentally out of control. I had no idea if he was going to go to his car and get a gun or a bat or something. Eventually he decided killing, or at least beating me up, wasn't worth his time, so he got in his car and drove off. That's the kind of irrational fear that is out there, driving up violence and sometimes murder. Current rate, we're putting 129 billion, I'm saying billion with a B, face masks into the environment every single month, and 65 billion plastic gloves into the environment every single month. A significant portion of those would be disposed of improperly and will wind up in the oceans. Everything is more wrapped in plastic and stored in plastic. No more bins to get food, no more use of reusable bags. All this increase in plastic pollution is not just another bottle floating around that looks ugly. We are in the middle of a plastic pollution disaster where it has already been predicted there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050 that weighs 850 million metric tons or equal to over 2,500 Empire State Buildings or over 550 million cars. This is a severe and significant threat to life on the planet. Our air, food, and water are already contaminated with microplastics that we are already breathing in, eating, and drinking. This pollution takes decades if not centuries to degrade. It is here to stay, and by the time we realize just how incredibly bad it is, there will be nothing we can do about it. There will be a globally high price to pay for our current plastic obsession to supposedly keep us safe. We are destroying our future to create an illusion we are safer. I'll talk a, a little bit more about this later on. How we have behaved has had a massive impact on so many. Quote, the entire world's economy has shrunk dramatically. The pandemic delivered the most severe blow to the U.S. economy since the Great Depression as gross domestic product collapsed and millions of jobs were lost. The effect of that social distancing has been deadly on many businesses. Restaurants have been among the hardest hit. According to Yelp data, more than 60% of restaurant closures are permanent followed by retail stores that sell clothing and home decor, 58%, and beauty stores and spas, 42%. Airline travel is down around 70%. Hotel occupancy is at record lows. Social distancing has stilled our strong economy, says Eric Rosengren, president of and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Finally, here's a bit of positive news due to how we reacted to this virus. Because of the lockdowns and shutting of industries, pollution levels dropped. This was particularly striking in the more polluted areas of Asia. For at least a few months, people who had been living in horrible smog finally had clear air to breathe. Keep in mind that around 9 million people each year die because of pollution. Clean air, especially if it's kept for the long term, would be saving a lot of people from sickness and death. Another plus is that CO2, a greenhouse gas, dropped by 17% globally due to a massive slowdown of inland transport such as cars, industry, and aviation. If this reduction continued over the long term, it would rein in the ever-increasing warming effects of growing greenhouse gases in the our atmosphere, although this is not likely to continue. And now the bad news. Air pollution is not just CO2 that warms the planet over the long term. 
It is also made of particular aerosols, which cause those nasty health effects to people in life. These aerosols are short-lived and consist of things like smoke and soot and sulfate particles. They cool the planet by reflecting light back into space. They are, in effect, a planetary-wide molecular sunscreen. Cooling aerosols have been masking nearly a third of the planetary warming that should have occurred to date. Suddenly stopping pollution, as has happened, will cause a rapid increase in surface temperatures. NOVA reported that this May was the hottest on record. There was already an increasing trend in temperatures, but it seems likely that suddenly removing our pollution sunscreen contributed to this heat. I'm concerned that the extreme heat that happened this year in Siberia and in the western United States resulted from suddenly allowing more solar energy to reach the ground, especially in Asia, where there's almost always a perpetual gray cloud over much of the area. Quote, an extended heat wave that has been baking the Russian Arctic for months drove the temperatures in Verkhonetsk, Russia, north of the Arctic Circle, to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit on June 20th. It was the hottest temperature ever recorded in the town. In May, air temperatures hovered some 18 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius above normal, something that would be likely to occur only once every 100,000 years if human-caused climate change hadn't thrown a wrench in the climate system's plumbing. Quote, from the historic heat wave and wildfires in the west to the mass of Dercherko that tore through the middle of the nation to the record-breaking pace of this year's hurricane season, the unprecedented and concurrent extreme conditions resemble the chaotic climate future scientists have been warning us for decades. Only it's happening right now. On August 16th, Death Valley reached 130 degrees Fahrenheit, the highest temperature ever reliably measured on Earth. It was just a small part of a monster heat wave which broke hundreds of heat records over a two-week span. There are indications that we are heading toward a collapse of the Arctic sea ice and massive amounts of permafrost burning releasing gigatons of carbon and methane. This is nothing short of a global catastrophe which will likely result in extreme weather events and radically change life on our planet. We should reflect on the quote that was on the first slide. Quote, nothing happens in a vacuum in life. Every action has serious consequences. And sometimes it takes a long time to fully understand the consequences of our actions. I certainly think we've made a complete mess of how we have reacted to this virus. It's been nothing but a disaster. Decisions have been made out of panic and fear by a very small group of people who apparently never consider the consequences of their actions. We will and are paying an ever-increasing high price for those actions. The term propaganda rings melodramatic and exaggerated, but a press that, whether from fear, careerism, or conviction, uncritically recites false government claims and reports them as, a f as fact, or treats elected officials as reverence reserved for royalty, cannot be accurately described as engaged in any other function. Glenn Greenwald I remember during the build-up to the Gulf War, I watched the main television station to see what they were saying. Almost all of them quickly lined up with the government position that we needed to invade Iraq because of WMDs, weapons of mass destruction. Fox, CNN, etc. all lined up to support attacking another country that had never done anything to us. Any dissenting view was quickly crushed. The media was nothing more than a mouthpiece for the government as official after official came on the air and repeated the mantra, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Repeating day after day the threat, constant fear, got public support to go bomb and kill men, women, and children. Many died. Some estimate over 200,000 civilians died. Many soldiers died too, then and later with a high suicide rate. There were no weapons found. It was all nothing but a disaster and a massive, with massive repercussions, especially for the people in the area. Yet we still use the same media to feed us information of what to believe, what to be afraid of, how to feel and act, and at the same time inundating everyone with products to buy that distract us and make us a sicker society. While all this is going on, there are other serious things that hardly, if ever, get a comment. 
I'd like to briefly mention a few of them that I feel are really critically in need of our attention. If you would like more information, please email me and I will send you a chapter from a book I've been working on on about all these topics. We are facing an ever-swelling tsunami of plastic waste that is difficult to imagine. The potential for biomagnification of plastic particulates in the environment is of significant concern for life all the way up the food chain, biosecurity, and ultimately human health. Dr. Lisa Amelia Svensson, a former director of the Ocean Branch of the UNMP, the U UN Environmental Program, said plastics are, quote, ruining the ecosystem of the ocean, end quote, and are nothing short of a, quote, planetary crisis, end quote. Eric Solheim, a former head of the UN's environment program, stated, quote, we're facing an ocean Armageddon. The entire planet is contaminated with this stuff, and it's only going to get worse and worse and much worse. We are already eating, drinking, and breathing in microplastics. This is a severe problem that needs everyone to stop using this stuff and develop real solutions to address it. Quote, each year at least 8 million tons of plastic leak into the ocean, which is equivalent to dumping the contents of one garbage truck into the ocean every minute. If no action is taken, this is expected to increase to 2 per minute by 2030 and 4 per minute by 2050. Estimates suggest that plastic packaging represents the majority share of this leakage. In a business as usual scenario, the ocean is expected to contain one ton of plastic for every three tons of fish by 2025, and by 2050, more plastics than fish by weight. By 2050, plastics will consume 20% of all oil production, up, for five, up from 5% today. One out of every five barrels of oil will not fuel or lubricate our machines, but will be used to make plastic. The report states that at least 8 million metric tons of plastic wa waste enters the oceans each year. If action is not taken by 2050, there will be more plastic in the sea than fish, weighing 850 million metric tons, or equal to over 2,508 Empire State Buildings, or over 550 million cars. According to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, 2020 report on the state of the world's fisheries, 34% of the world's stock are now overfished and unsustainable. An additional 60% of fish stocks are at the maximum limit and have no room for further expansion. This leaves only about 6% of the world's fish stocks as underfished. Massive trawlers circle the globe, scooping up every living thing Within the coming couple of decades, much of the life in the ocean could collapse. There's an article from the New York Times in 2017. China's appetite pushes fisheries to the brink. Quote, in Senegal, an impoverished nation of 14 million fishing stocks are plummeting. Local fishermen working out of hand-hewn canoes compete with mega trawlers whose mile-long nets sweep up virtually every living thing. Most of the fish they catch is sent abroad with a lot ending up as fish meal fodder for chickens and pigs in the United States and Europe. Glaciers across the planet are vanishing. Time and water are running out for the world, and the picture is very bleak. If there are vast water shortages, which are almost certainly going to happen in the foreseeable future, we are talking about a colossal human disaster. The United Nations estimates two-thirds of the world's population will live in water stress areas within the next 20 years, with much of that population living in Asia. Rapid population and economic growth are putting a strain on the two linked resources of energy and water. Energy production produces greenhouse gases that heat up the atmosphere and simultaneously diminish and contaminate water sources vital to life. China's unquenchable thirst for water and energy has caused extensive deterioration of its own major rivers. This may bring catastrophic consequences for future generations because some of the harm already done is irreversible. The Amazon River Basin is an immense region made up of a mosaic of ecosystems ranging from savannas to swamps and is home to the largest contiguous rainforest on Earth. With its intricacies and vastness, the Amazon contains a magnificent diversity of life, providing a home 
to one out of every five mammal, fish, bird, and tree species in the world. While the Amazon rainforest covers only 4% of the Earth's surface, the more than 400 mammal, 40,000 plants, and 2.5 million identified insect species, and a myriad of other invertebrates, microbial and fungal life forms, make it the most abundant habitat on the planet. Yet has been over the decades is being slowly hacked down for cheap beef, gold, timber, and other resources. In the end, most of the Amazon may collapse, leaving behind savanna and desert, with massive repercussions not only to South America, but the entire planet. Quote, the World Bank released a study that finally puts the impacts of climate change, deforestation, and fires together. The tipping point for the Amazon is 20% deforestation, and that's a very scary result. The Amazon jungle is very close to a tipping point, and if destruction continues, it could shrink to one-third of its original size in just 65 years. The forest eventually converts to Cerrado, which is the Brazilian savanna, and lots of fire, human misery, loss of biodiversity, and emissions of carbon into the atmosphere. Human beings are taking an increasingly substantial toll on Earth's biodiversity, stamping out other forms of life for profit and pleasure. We live in a world already radically transformed by human activity and humanity's global footprint is expanding and continuing to adversely affect species across the planet. The destructive environmental impact by civilization has occurred since before modern times, but has become considerably more evident and severe in recent centuries. The world now faces a sixth mass extinction event whose causes are well connected to stressors such as habitat loss, Overexploitation, invasive species, and climate change. Environmental fragmentation can be more than sufficient to cut species off food and water as well as mates, which allows for species to thrive. This can cause a downward population spiral that will become irreversible. As more wildlife is exterminated and habitats are destroyed, planetary ecosystems fall apart and extinctions will snowball. In science fiction shows, or even discussed by people such as Elon Musk, is the idea to transform another planet, often Mars is used as an example, terraform it into an Earth-like paradise. Ironically, to my mind, we are taking this beautiful planet and through greed and neglect are turning it into a largely lifeless garbage dump. We are de-terraforming it. We really need to wake up and start taking care of what we have left and change course before there isn't much left for us and our children. One more thing I want to mention, the largest and greatest machine ever constructed is our electrical grid. Everything in our modern society, computers, lights, refrigeration, transportation, etc. lies on electrical power. Yet it's old and decaying and vulnerable to a large solar storm. If it hits at the right time, no more grid for years. The result would be beyond imagining and it would happen all within a couple of seconds. Truly terrifying and with about a 1% chance of this civilization ending event happening each year, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I hope what I've presented has provided a different perspective. COVID-19 is not the end of the world, as many have made it out to be. We can rethink how we have behaved and be smarter and healthier. We can act appropriately and not give in to fear. We can have a better society and a better planet. We are all on a life journey and we can decide not to live healthy and we can end up with a myriad of sicknesses or we can decide to live better, be more. It's apparent that a relatively small number of individuals decide how we should all feel and react. They have not taken all the effects of their actions into account. Certain groups, either intentionally or not, have decided what history is and because they control the present, they are controlling the future. They only control the future with our consent. It's up to us. So much of our society is based on profit and self-interest. We live in a system where a drug like Vioxx is promoted and accepted and killed thousands of people, while cheap or free vitamin D that could save tens of thousands isn't given much notice. Products that make us obese are promoted for big profits, while an organic farmer is hardly recognized. Greed is not only destroying our health, but also destroying the planet. Huge amounts of money influence the media and politicians, and they, in turn, tell you what to think and do. If we realize this massive distortion, we can break free of it 
and make far better choices. Several physicians and epidemiologists have a different perspective than those are almost universally adopted by various individuals and the media. Their ideas based on the data is to immediately open schools and allow young people to resume their lives without fear. Everything should open and we should focus on protecting the vulnerable. I think you should visit their site and listen to what they have to say. I would add to their ideas some of the things I mentioned including vitamin D, especially for the elderly and those with darker skin. Here are some of the great people in history. They made a difference on our planet, but really they were just people that stepped out of the ordinary because they dared. They dared to be different and be more than they were. All of us can be great. We can be healthier and happier. We can treat everyone with respect and compassion. We can find forgiveness in our hearts. Each and every one of us can be more. We can transform ourselves, our society, and our planet into a beautiful future. Thank you for your time and interest. You can contact me at dissolvingillusionsbook at gmail.com or movingbackfrommidnight at gmail.com. I wish you peace, happiness, and love.